Howdy, it's Kyle talking about symbiotic cities. These are cities that have grown together through the years and have a unique relationship being so close to each other and having grown together for so long. And I want to make a distinction between the cities I'll be discussing in this video and ones like Dallas, Fort Worth or San Francisco, San Jose or Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Those are ones where the individual cities grew and grew and kind of grew into each other into one large metro. Here I'll be talking about ones that were founded at about the same time very close to each other or right next to each other and have just grown together through the years as essentially one city or one symbiotic system. So let's take a look at some of these symbiotic cities here in the U.S. There are many twin cities in the U.S., but I'm going to start off by talking about the most famous twin cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. At the most recent census, Minneapolis had about 430,000 people and St. Paul about 307,000. And what makes this different than Dallas, Fort Worth or Raleigh, Durham is that these two cities are separated by only the Mississippi River. So the riverfronts of these two cities have been looking at each other for well over 150 years. With the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, when the U.S. bought a bunch of land from France, the Mississippi River flowed between what is currently Minneapolis and St. Paul, and that was the border of the Louisiana Territory. So what is Minneapolis was part of the Louisiana Purchase, but what is St. Paul wasn't. And of course, France didn't really control this, and the U.S. bought a bunch of land from people that didn't really control it. And after the purchase, big surprise here, the U.S. went across the river and stole a bunch of land from the Dakota Indians and took what is now St. Paul as part of the U.S. St. Paul was founded in 1854. The first bridge over the Mississippi River was built in 1855, and then Minneapolis was founded in 1867. And these two cities have been more or less equal through the years, roughly in the same size range, and St. Paul being the state capital, Minneapolis being the home to the major campus of the University of Minnesota, and being the main financial center for the state. So things might not work out so well if they were individual cities, but together they are what are known as the Twin Cities. Next, a city that straddles a state line, Bristol, Tennessee, and Bristol, Virginia. Bristol, Tennessee has about 27,000 people, and Bristol, Virginia has about 17,000. Each city is an individual city with its own mayor and city council, but when you visit there, it really does feel like one city. State Street is the main street through downtown, and it is the state border. They were both incorporated in 1856 when a railroad was connected right there with the state line. And the Bristol area is known officially as the birthplace of country music. So these two cities have grown in unison for about the past 150 years or so and today are part of the greater Tri-Cities area along with Johnson City and Kingsport, Tennessee. Okay, the same part of the country, similar situation, Bluefield, Virginia and Bluefield, West Virginia. The West Virginia side with about 10,000 people is the more populous side. It was founded in 1882. The Virginia side was founded in 1884 and today has 5,000 people. And the West Virginia side is also where the railroad is, so that's largely why it's older and more developed. It's worth noting that West Virginia broke off from Virginia in 1863 during the Civil War, so Bluefield on both sides were founded after the split. So with it being right on the state line of a Confederate and Union state, you can imagine that many black folks from Virginia moved to West Virginia, and today, Bluefield, West Virginia has a large black population relative to West Virginia at about 23%. And with this area being heavy coal country in southern West Virginia, it's very poor, high poverty rate, and both Bluefield, Virginia and West Virginia are losing population today. Other cities with a similar situation as Bristol and Bluefield are Texarkana, Texas, and Arkansas. They're very similar in population, 36,000 on the Texas side, 30,000 on the Arkansas side. And this is not fast-growing Texas, fast-growing northwest Arkansas. This is northeast Texas, southwest Arkansas, and both sides of the state line are losing population. Both cities were founded in 1874, and like many others on this list, came to be when railroads from each direction met at the state line. One thing worth noting is that because Texas has no state income tax, and Arkansas does, if you live on the Arkansas side of Texarkana, you don't pay income tax as if you lived on the Texas side. This overall region is referred to as Arklatex, as it's right where Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas come together. And one thing that's always bothered me about this area is there's an old song called Cotton Fields, and a line in it is, it was down in Louisiana, just about a mile from Texarkana. And why I've always hated that is because Texarkana isn't at the exact tri-state points. So you cannot be in Louisiana and be only one mile from Texarkana. So I'm calling on all of you right now to cancel this old song for its geographic inaccuracies. And the last cities that I'll mention that have same names in different states right across the border from each other are Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas. As of right now, Kansas City, Missouri has about 508,000 with flat line growth. 
and Kansas City, Kansas has about 156,000 people with some slight growth. Kansas City, Missouri was founded first at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri Rivers. It was named after the Kansas River, not Kansas Territory, as Kansas did not become a state until 1861. Kansas City, Kansas was founded in 1872, and it was founded to be a suburb of Kansas City, Missouri. And similar to Bluefield, much of the black population on the Missouri side after the Civil War moved across the border into Kansas, which was a free state. In case the South wanted to secede again, these people were already in a free state. And for the symbiotic cities that I think have the coolest names, it's Lewiston, Idaho, and Clarkston, Washington. And no surprise, these towns are named after Lewis and Clark. The expedition paddled through the Snake River right in this area in 1805. There are far more people on the Idaho side, about 35,000, only about 7,000 on the Washington side. So if you like potatoes, a lot of them were put onto a boat in Clarkston, Washington, and shipped out from there. And this is a very remote part of the country. Once you get outside of these twin cities, there really isn't much population for quite a distance. And the closest distance population center in this area is the next one I'm going to mention, Pullman, Washington, and Moscow, Idaho. It's quite interesting that two of these twin cities are in the same part of the country, and it's a very remote part of the country. And these towns are a little bit different because they are eight miles apart, and there is some open space between the two. Pullman, Washington has about 35,000 people, and Moscow, Idaho has about 25,000. Both of these towns were founded in 1887, and both are important college towns. In 1889, the state of Idaho chose this area to be the home of the major state university. And based on where the population of Idaho largely lives today, it seems kind of strange, but at that time, most of the population in Idaho was in the northern part of the state, in the Panhandle. And then after the University of Idaho was established in 1889, Washington State University was established in Pullman in 1892. And I can imagine there have been plenty of cross-border pranks going on between the students of these two universities. And for the context of this video, I find it very interesting that two of the areas I'm talking about, Lewiston and Clarkston, Pullman and Moscow are both right next to each other in the middle of nowhere. Next, I'm going to mention ones that I'm quite familiar with, and that's Fresno and Clovis, California. These are right in the Central Valley, approximately halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles. At the most recent census, Fresno has about 542,000 people, Clovis about 120,000, and they're both growing quite a bit. Fresno was founded in 1885 and Clovis in the 1890s. And what makes these two so interesting is that they've been joined at the hip for 130 years, but there's never been any suburbs. It's always just been Fresno and Clovis. And once you leave the conglomeration of these two, it's just farmland. And there are plenty of parts of the country where it's just two small towns similar to that, but nowhere in the country where it's two big cities, over 100,000 people, Fresno has well over half a million. And Clovis is much nicer than Fresno, so Fresno's stats are often pretty bad because a lot of it is fairly poor and relatively high crime, but you have a whole area, Clovis, which is mostly pretty nice. You almost have to think of Clovis as being the nicest part of Fresno. Another one that straddles a state line where the border is a river is Grand Forks, North Dakota, and East Grand Forks, Minnesota. There are far more people on the North Dakota side. Grand Forks has about 60,000 people and is growing, and there's only 9,000 people on the Minnesota side, and it's flat growth. The reason why you have so many more people on the North Dakota side is that it's home to both the University of North Dakota and Grand Forks Air Force Base. So you have two major employers on the North Dakota side and mainly just residential areas on the Minnesota side. For most metro areas that straddle a state line, the state that has lower taxes is going to have the larger population. And that's certainly true in this situation, but I do think it is more because of the main job centers on the North Dakota side. The Red River is the river that flows between the two, and this is a major flood hazard area. There was a massive flood in 1997. Many of the riverfront areas were completely destroyed, and the areas that were destroyed along the floodplain is now a large riverfront park. And similar to Lewiston and Clarkston, there really isn't much else outside of this area besides Grand Forks and East Grand Forks. And the last one that I'm going to mention are not the Twin Cities, they're not the Tri-Cities, they're the Quad Cities. And this refers to a metropolitan area that straddles the Mississippi River between Iowa and Illinois. This area is referred to as the Quad Cities, but there are actually five of them. The largest of them is Davenport, Iowa, with about 101,000 people. And the other ones are all much smaller. Rock Island, Illinois, 57,000 people. Moline, Illinois, 42,000. Bettendorf, Iowa, 39,000. And East Moline, Illinois, 21,000. The Quad Cities metro area has about 474,000 people. 
So you had Davenport, founded in 1839, is the oldest of them, and then just across the river in 1848 in Moline is where John Deere started up his operations. Rock Island was founded in 1841 and is the county seat on the Illinois side, and it's home to the Rock Island Arsenal, which is a large military operation for making ammunition. But like I mentioned before, there are five Quad Cities. Originally, Davenport, Iowa, as well as Rock Island, Moline, and East Moline, Illinois, were the Quad Cities. However, Bettendorf, Iowa, founded in 1903, has had lots of growth and has been much more suburban. And by 1970, Bettendorf had passed East Moline in terms of population, and now Bettendorf was the fourth largest. So because it became larger than East Moline, and East Moline was one of the Quad Cities, they still call it the Quad Cities, although they've included Bettendorf in recent years. And there's just something off about Midwestern math. Five Quad Cities, 16 universities in the Big Ten. But then again, I don't really know the math either. Here I am talking about the Quad Cities in a video about Twin Cities. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography from a nerdy perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special shout out to my superior patrons for their support. If you're interested in purchasing a pin for the viewer wall map or just to support the channel, please check out my Patreon page, link in the description. And as always, thank you very much.